this year, we're starting with four major areas. You. Your family. Your church. And your world. We know Jesus is the center of all. Jesus is out to know you. Like the first video we saw. He came down so that you would know him and he would know you. No one knows you like Jesus. Jesus has gone to hell. For you. He carried our sicknesses and bore our diseases. He understands the feeling of disease. As God, He could not feel these things because there was no sickness in Him. As God, He could not understand loneliness because He was in all. And through all. As God, he did not know hunger. As God, he did not know pain. As God, he did not know what you went through. But as Jesus, he understood what abuse was about, he understood what pain and suffering. He understood what it was to lose a loved one. He understood what it was not to see a miracle when he went to preach to his own. And he could do no great miracle in his town because of their unbelief. He understood loneliness like no one understood it before. When on the cross, having carried the sins of mankind, he became separated from him who was all life as Jesus took on all death. And from the depths and the bowels of the inside, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you want to know someone who understands you, know Jesus. If you want to know someone who understands the difficulty and the pain, know him who has gone through it all. If you want to know the person who has the power to change your future, know Jesus. Paul understood. He counted all things as dung that he might know the excellencies of the riches of Christ and him crucified. Can you say amen to that? What a privilege we have to know Jesus. What an honor to be joined him and to be one with him. You think you're going through a hard time? Oh, we don't know what a hard time is. Like we don't know what hell is. Not one person on this earth has prayed so hard that the capillaries on their forehead burst and mixed with the sweat of it with drops of blood watched it hit the floor. No, what we have are light afflictions. Now this isn't in my notes. So just take it as thus saith the Lord. What we go through is but light affliction 
And when we see Jesus, we will see the glory of the blessing of knowing Him. Amen. Throw up that first screen for me, Crystal, if you would. The world. She's going to regret it. She's working on it. Go ahead. There it goes. She's wet. The computer's too slow. The world. The world out there. What are they doing? What is the world seeking? Go ahead. In life, oops, back up, sister. You didn't do that, did you? How did that happen? There. If you think about it, everybody in the world is looking for a position, aren't they? I'm looking for an entry-level position. I want a future. And so we have the world, a multitude, a host of people clamoring and trying to seek a job. A J O B. Once you find that entry level position, you find this nothing's really changed, just the next level, and people are pushing. And and Eddie, I'm so sorry, brother. No, would you just continue with that? It was just so nice. I missed it. I understand, bro. That's all right. Amen. We just we just flow it. They're just looking for the next position, the managerial position, and they are pushing to get in there. All sides, all seeking. I want the next level. I want the supervisory position. They believe that something is there in the supervisory position. Something more, a challenge. So when they get there, I don't know about you. Have you ever heard someone pray for a job then shout up and down and say, what a great thing. God has given me a job. And a year later, he's complaining. Oh, I just got a horrible job. Well, what happened? I thought you were excited. You were rejoicing. Did the job change? Or did the perspective change? They're pushing. They're clamoring. I want a managerial position. And finally, the great and notable day comes and you get your promotion. Sometimes with a 10 cent raise. Sometimes more extravagant. Maybe a couple of thousand. But when you get to the managerial position, you find out that nothing's really changed because everybody in a managerial position is seeking a upper level management position. And they're pushing and they're clamoring and they're doing everything they can to get that upper level management because there must be something there. So finally they get there. When they get there, did they find something new? Not at all. They find that the upper level management is pushing and shoving and trying to get to the corporate CEO. And they're all there again. You ever wonder what happens after you get to the corporate CEO? Sometimes. You wonder why so many CEOs are unhappy? I'm not saying there aren't CEOs that are happy. There are some that are happy. But why are so many of them unhappy? What's what's the key? What's the reason why there are so many CEOs that are unhappy? You know what? There were three caterpillars. Actually, two. They were up on a tree. And they were talking to each other. Joe and Mary. Hopefully there's no two people here, Joe and Mary. (laughs) And Joe and Mary looked off in the distance and they saw a great pole. 
that went up to the sky and they could not see what was at the top. But all the caterpillars were all traveling towards this pole and they were climbing and trying to get to the top of that pole. And so they talked to each other and Joe said to Mary, Mary, let's, let's go and see what's up. So they shimmied on down that tree and they joined the multitude as they walked towards that pole. They finally got to the pole and began their ascent to the, to the top. And while they were trying to get up, we had one stepping on another and other one climbing on top of the other and one trying to push the other off to try to get ahead and moving to the top. And until all of a sudden, Joe just kind of looked down for a minute. Now, if you're a caterpillar and climbing up a pole with a bunch of caterpillars, there's one thing you know you shouldn't do. Look down. Because when he looked down, he saw Janie. And Janie saw him. And he fell in love. And all of a sudden, he had no desire to climb up the pole and started going down. Mary said, where are you going? I'm sorry. It is what it is. And so they shimmied on down, the two of them, and they climbed up back on that oak tree. And all of a sudden, they had this inward desire to build a cocoon. Both twirled and spun their silk. I don't know if they make silk, but whatever they make. Until they came into that cocoon and stood there. Days later, as we all know, it began to crack open. And slowly outside came a beautiful, two beautiful butterflies. Flapping their wings to get it dried, they took off towards the pole. Because there were still a multitude thousands and thousands pushing, shoving, trying to get to the top. So they flittered and fluttered up to the top and when they got to the top they found out that at the top of the pole was nothing. And the people shoving from below was so intense that those on the top would fall off to their death because there was nothing at the top. All the shoving to get ahead, the stabbing in the back, trying to be the head, going for what everybody else is saying, keep pushing and shoving because if you get to the top, you have it all. Am I saying that you shouldn't prosper? Not at all. Am I saying that God doesn't want you to move forward? Not at all. But that's the world's way. What if we decided to find out what God's way is? Could we do that? Go ahead and show the next screen. God. The center of it all. Let me read you a scripture in John. If you want to follow me, you'd have to open up your Bible because we're going to keep that screen up. It'd be John chapter 16. John chapter 16. I'm going to start reading from verse number 13. I'm going to read from the New King James Version because I know it bothers Rob when I do that. (laughs) But my son is happy when I do that. Are you there? Verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. Amen. 
He will not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. I think that's important to know what tomorrow brings before it comes. He shall glorify me, listen, for he shall receive of mine and show it to you. Now here, here it is. All things that are of the Father, that which he hath, the Father has given it to Jesus. Therefore, he said, what I have, he shall take of mine and show it to you. Now, I would like to give the proposal here that God is already at the top. And that at that top, there is everything. Yet, God is not trying to exalt himself. Listen, the world is pressing to get up. The Father pressed to give Jesus all that he did. Jesus pressed downward to give the Holy Spirit all that he had. Hit that. And the Holy Spirit is pressing to give to you. In this case, I'd like to say that when Jesus was on the earth and he was filled with the Holy Ghost and he did nothing that he didn't see the Father do and it was the Holy Spirit that did it in him, go with the next circle, I would say that Jesus wasn't trying to get up. He was pushing down. And he was pushing all that he had, not for his glory trying to get higher, but taking all that he had and trying to push it lower. And he pushed into the disciples all that he had. And I were, would say that after the disciples became apostles those that used to be within the ranks of Jesus and left came back and I propose that then the disciples began to push not upward but downward into the 70 to get all that they had not to promote themselves but to try to promote the 70 and then the 70 just didn't stand around and try to, oh, I want to push upward to become an apostle. I want to push upward to become the next one in charge. But I purport that the 70 then pushed outward and tried to reach the multitude that Jesus had already reached not to promote themselves but to get what they had inside of them into the multitude they weren't pushing upward they were pushing downward are you listening to me because then the multitude did not try to become the next one in charge but became servants and tried to reach the world. Hit him one more time. There it is. The world. What am I saying with this? I'm saying that so many times we even get it wrong in church. There are people who are trying to become something in the church. God's not looking for people to become something in the church. He wants us to press out of the church. As I was talking, we were sharing with the Connect Group leaders on Friday, and I really suggest you get hooked up to some Connect Groups, form relationships, push outward, form relationships. I was talking to, to Jay Colon, and he said, you know what? In the workplace, they're now talking about servant leadership. 
Now that's a Christian term. Because Jesus Christ said, I did not come to be what? Serve, but to serve. Servant leadership. They're trying to promote within the context of so many businesses that the best way to go up is to go down. That isn't about the one in charge being so great as it is the one in charge trying to help the ones below him become great. They're not pushing upward, they're pushing downward. Because I tell you what, those people who push upward when they get to the top, they will have created a whole culture of people pushing until the upward one gets fired or makes the mistake. Is that true? That's true. This year we're talking about you. Your servant leadership. Let, let me tell you what happened. Jesus willingly was pushed out of heaven. And on this earth, he was pushed further to what the Bible says, the lowest parts of hell. He went the lowest. Because he became a servant to all, he became the greatest of them all. Because when you push downward, Jesus felt the power of the Holy Spirit with the right arm of God come all the way to the very depths of the furthest servant position you can get and got yanked out with all power and might, dominion, and authority and was placed at the right hand of the Father. When you become a servant, when you become a servant leader at your job place and become the slave of your employees. If you start trying to make others great and become lower, you have just opened up the door for God to get his strong arm to your place of business and yank you out from that place of servanthood and seat you at the greater height. And as long as you live the paradigm, the way of living of servant leadership, you will find that if you ever become a CEO, you won't find, quote unquote, nothing at the top. You will find God at the top. Can you imagine how businesses would change? If they all had the Christian concept, I'm not here to be served, but to serve. Look what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And verse 6. Are you getting something tonight? Say, I am a miracle. Verse 6. 2 Timothy. It's after 1 Timothy. It says in verse 6, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God. Say, I have a gift of God. 
You're gifted. You are a miracle. You have giftings. He gave to everyone, the Bible says, the same measure of faith and began to enumerate the different gifts in Romans chapter 8. All types of gifts. Giving gifts, administration gifts, leadership gifts, exhortation gifts, compassion gifts. But there's no one who does not have a gift. You are a miracle. And he says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us. Say, I'm saved. Today's message is saved and called. Not just saved, but called. You want a calling? You're already called. Because he said, right there, who has saved us and what? Called us with a holy calling. Say, I'm a miracle. I'm saved. I'm called. You are called. You are called to be a servant leader. You are called to press outward, not up. You are called to serve, and the more you serve, the more you will be promoted. If they abuse you, God will use you. He saved us and called us with a holy call. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, because this is a year of great grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Praise God. Jesus abolished death and now you have life and you are called to press outward. We don't see miracles because we never press outward. You press outward, you're going to see miracles. It's not about you, but it is all about you. It's not about how great you are. It's about great God is. But it's how God wants to use you. He is the center of it all. But he is pushing heaven into earth. He's trying to get what's up there down to what's down here. He's trying to get the order that's in heaven down to the disorder that is here on the earth and we are the called ones to push into the world and make that difference that person who's walking and hurting God wants you to push into that and be the vessel for see someone who's hungry, God wants you to push into that and minister supply to the needy. It isn't about trying to get to the pulpit. It's about trying to get to the world. I propose that in Christianity, there are too many people trying to push upward and not enough people pushing downward. It 
say I'm called. It shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them in Romans 9, 26. I'm going to read this quickly. You are not my people. There was a time when it was said, you are not my people. But now there's, they're saying, they shall be called sons of the living God. They shall be called. Say, I'm called. Say, I'm a miracle. I'm called. In Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Pastor Guy talked about that last week. On Sunday morning, great anointed message. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Look at the person next to you and say, You're called. Amen. want to become an apostle evangelist apostle prophet evangelist pastor teacher try being a servant of them all Philip was first a server before God called him an evangelist he wasn't seeking it he wasn't asking for it. He was pressing downward. And God put him above. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians 1, nine. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Galatians 5.13 For you brethren have been called to liberty. Aren't you glad you're not bound up anymore? You are called to get out of it. Don't use the liberty as an opportunity to do whatever you want in the flesh. But instead love and serve one another in that beautiful calling. Colossians 3.15 Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were also called into one body and be thankful. Hebrews 3.1 Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Say, I have a heavenly calling. You're not just saved. You're called. What do saved people do? They sit down and say, Oh, thank you, Jesus, I'm saved. And then they sing their song. It's all about me, Jesus. But it's not. Jesus is the center of it all. If you leave here tonight, there's something you want to go home with. You want to go home with, I am a miracle. Why don't you say that? Look at the person next to you and say, what a beautiful miracle.
And number two, say, I'm not just saved. I'm called with a heavenly calling and Jesus is the center of it all. Give God a big praise. Come on. Come on, give him a big praise tonight. Stand up.